home state for Alex. <laughs> and uh, I think with, uh, with that, it's time that we get to it. I'm thrilled to roll out this week's episode of the Quantum Life Seminar Series dedicated to the research and academic communities. Uh, this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will remain hosted live uh, for playback on this channel. So you can always go back and rewind and see where uh, everybody's tuned in from and what Alex is going to share with us today. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to introduce Alex. Hello, Alex. Uh, how are you? Hi, Zlatko. Great to be here. It's really humbling to hear about all of the countries, people from all sorts of countries following us. So it's good to uh, be here. I know. Right? So thank you for joining us and accepting the invitation. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in from all over the world. Uh, it's very exciting for Alex and for myself. Uh, Alex will talk about the readout problem today. And uh, where is that going to be from, Alex? Where are you tuning in from? I'm tuning in from Sherbrooke, which is in Quebec in Canada. And uh, it's, a, it's a great place. I had the chance to visit last summer. Uh, before we pull up your slides, let me give a bit of background to um, Alex's history here. He is currently at the University of Sherbrooke. Uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow at um, uh, Princeton University with Hikan Turechi before that. And before that, he did his uh, degree at Yale University with Kareem and Steve Gervin. Uh, and I think with that, Alex, we're ready to pull up your slides. Folks, feel free to ask questions of Alex during the talk in the comment chat box. Okay, um, so yeah, thank you for the introduction. So as you mentioned, I um, I um, I was at uh, at Yale before doing my PhD with Karine Levure, and uh, I was also co-advised by Steve. At that point, I was doing condensed matter, uh, but then I switched to circuit QED. So what you'll hear about today is 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 a bit of a mix of methods from condensed matter and circuit QED. At least those of you with a condensed matter background will, will kind of get a feel of that. So I'm going to talk about the readout problem in circuit QED um, and about, in particular, drive effects on the Purcell uh, effect and on nonlinear relaxation processes. And before explaining to you what all of that means, I want to acknowledge uh, people that I've collaborated with on this problem. So most of this work uh, was uh, was done with uh, Moin Malika Klak and Hakan Tureji in, in Princeton during my first postdoc. And I've got ongoing efforts on this problem, especially on the numerical fr front using uh, Floquet master equation techniques uh, here in Sherbrooke with Camille Kalonek and with Alexandre Blais. Um, so, Without uh, further ado, I want to begin by presenting the general context of this talk. And this is one sketch representation of a circuit QED setup, which consists of one qubit, which I'm idealizing here as a two-level system uh, coupled to a cavity. And in reality, this qubit is, as we know today, uh, part of a lattice of qubits coupled to each other. Uh, so this is a, a real many body problem, but for this talk, I will only think about one qubit and in particular about how its interactions with the outside environment um, are, um, which are uh, for the purpose of this talk mediated by this cavity that surrounds it. Um, I'm interested in knowing how these interactions are addressed or enhanced by the presence of the drives. These could be readout drives or controls of the qubit and so on. So this very setup is what allows us to do, uh, to do measurements on the qubit. The, uh, Hamiltonian that we, the idealized Hamiltonian that we can write for this system is a Jeans Cummings Hamiltonian, where the cavity is this bosonic degree of freedom C, and the qubit is this uh, this uh, uh, a Pauli operator sigma z, and there's a there's a coupling between the uh, artificial atom, the qubit, and the cavity, which we denote by G, and in a specific regime where the detuning between the qubit and the cavity are, uh, is, is large compared to the qubit to cavity coupling, we can go to this so-called dispersive frame um, where the Hamiltonian writes rather like this. So uh, there's a, uh, uh, it takes a form in which the interaction between the qubit and the cavity um, now commutes, uh, it's the sigma z times the photon number of the cavity, now commutes with both the Hamiltonian for the cavity and the Hamiltonian for the qubit. This is called a quantum non-demolition setup. And 
what this does is basically dependent on the state of the qubit, whether it's in its zero or its one state, there will be a frequency pull on the cavity, which you can see if you do spectroscopy on the cavity near the cavity frequency. Um, and um, what's important to say here is that this form of the Hamiltonian is what allows us to, to, uh, to uh, measure the state of the qubit, but there are higher order terms and corrections to this Hamiltonian, which can basically disturb this perfect picture. So in fact, this Hamiltonian has this quantum non-demolition form, but it also has corrections. And it's important to take in, in, into account these corrections because there can be quantum non-demolition effects, non-quantum non-demolition effects on Rita. And I'd like to acknowledge here one of the first papers that actually uh, looked at this uh, systematically comes from Alexandra's group uh, from 2009, where the dispersive effects uh, were actually analyzed directly on the Lindblad master equation. So describing how basically what's omitted here and, uh, 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 plays a role um, in, in dressing relaxation rates. So I'm going to now uh, be able to uh, give you a first impression of what the readout problem is. This is an example of a non-QND effect. Uh, so going beyond the first few terms in that dispersive Hamiltonian. So first of all, I have to tell you how we do a T1 measurement, or at least a theorist's idealization of, of that. Um, you would use a qubit control in order to uh, pi pulse the qubit from its ground state into the excited state, and then uh, wait a variable amount of time, delta T, which is uh, during which time the qubit slowly makes its, uh, its way back from the excited state towards its ground state. Um, and then after delta T, you turn on a measurement uh, pulse, which is uh, near the cavity frequency. This measurement pulse has a certain power. And uh, from that, you can uh, infer the populations of the states of the qubit, the population of the excited state, the population of the zero state. Um, and uh, you repeat this many times, uh, and then um, on average, you will find that the population of the excited state uh, has an exponential decay. So if you plot the, uh, the population of the excited state in a log scale versus the delay time, you find that it's, it's a line, which indicates an it's an exponential decay whose characteristic time is the T1, the energy relaxation time of the qubit. Um, but there is a problem with this, and uh, I'm going to uh, make reference to, to a paper um, uh, published by, uh, by our host, in fact. Um, if uh, you vary the power of the measurement drive, what you find is that contrary to what you would expect and what you would want, um, the T1 of the qubit decreases, or equivalently, the relaxation rate of the qubit decreases as you increase the cavity population. So this is a real problem because it hampers your efforts to increase the measurement fidelity or the speed at which you're taking this measurement. I, and, and I'll just echo this. This can actually be a really big problem and, and was one of the main limitations in designing my experiment. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know that there's a really great known solution yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think that uh, that Michel Devore calls this the skeleton in the closet. That's what I heard. It's an anecdote. I have not heard it uh, yes. said directly, <laughs> but... Uh, um, yeah, I guess yeah, I guess this right. is work on skeletons in the closet. Um, I like that title, by the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. So, in a more controlled experiment, actually, in in uh, Michel Devore's group at Yale, um, which was shown at the APS March meeting uh, by by Shantanu Mundada, uh, you can actually do a little more to characterize this problem. So, after you've done the pi pulse, and while you're waiting for the qubit to relax, you're actually filling the cavity with a given n bar. So you're making sure that while the qubit is relaxing, there's an n bar steady state population in the cavity. And you can do so because the relaxation rate of the cavity compared to the, to the, to the relaxation rate of the qubit is much, much faster. So the, the cavity will really relax to its steady state population um, um, very soon while the qubit is, is, is decaying. Um, and what those experiments found is that there can be a dramatic increase in the relaxation rates of the qubit. It can be up to 100% with as little as five readout cavity photons. Moreover, it found that the increase of the relaxation and excitation rates um, uh, is linear with, uh, with the readout cavity photon number n bar, even if you have a Purcell filter. So 
in addition to that, it found that qubits appear to cool. That is, while, while you would expect that as you're driving harder on the cavity, you should excite the qubit more and its steady state population should increase as a function of the drive power. In fact, what happens is that the steady state population can decrease as a function of drive power. So this is quite counterintuitive. And I'd like to say that this is not only the case for transmons or transmon-like degrees of freedom, which are weakly anharmonic, but it can also happen for fluxonium. So also at Yale, non-QMD effects in fluxonium were seen at, uh, at photon numbers of order one or two, which is this paper. But more recently in fluxonium, there has been a, a, a very interesting experiment, which se seems to show no significant reduction of T1 with photon numbers in excess of 100. And this is what granular aluminum fluxonium qubits made in, in Katsura, in one pops group. So there are lots of puzzles already at the experimental level. Um, and let's see what kind of theories were put forth in order to explain these effects. So, so one theory um, which was tried on, on Shantanu's experiments was stress defacing. So basically, um, uh, this comes back to the same uh, paper that accounts for uh, dispersive effects on the, on the master equation. Um, and uh, what they show there is that if you have a defacing, um, if, you, if you couple the qubit to, a, to, a, to a, an environment which causes defacing on the qubit, when you drive the readout cavity, there will be an effective uh, relaxation rate induced onto the qubit due to the fact that it was coupled to a defacing channel. And this uh, relaxation rate on the qubit is proportional to the end bar of the drive, which kind of fits the picture with what we're seeing in experiments. Um, and uh, the relaxation rate is dictated by the spectral function uh, uh, of the defacing channel, uh, close to this, uh, basically close to zero frequency, because in readout you're, uh, no, sorry, close to the detuning between the cavity and the qubit, because you should really think uh, for the for this talk that the drive uh, frequency is very close to the cavity frequency. So um, this kind of theory uh, is expected to work for photon numbers, which are, which are significantly less than the so-called critical photon number, which just to give you a, a, a ballpark picture for this, it should be about 20 photons for the experiments that I, I, I showed you before, but it can be varied and it's really a function of how weakly you're coupling the cavity to the qubit. So dress phasing is consistent with experiments performed at Berkeley. For example, this, uh, this paper, which actually used this effect in order to probe the, the noise spectral function. However, it was inconsistent with, uh, with experiments at Yale where qubits were found to cool instead of heating up. So this would have only fit if, if negative temperature was, was, was used, which, which would be absurd. Um, so, I'm going on to tell you about a second puzzle. So that's, that's what the theory of dress defacing, which would predict T1 to increase, says. Um, you could think about another uh, mechanism in which basically the Purcell decay, so the, the qubit decaying through the cavity. Um, the, it, in a sense, this is a spontaneous emission of the qubit uh, immersed in the electromagnetic uh, background of the cavity. You would expect the Purcell decay to be the one that's increasing with n bar. And then that would give you T1 versus N bar of the readout problem. But in fact, um, refinements of the, of the James Cummings theory that I showed you before and the inclusion of dispersive effects actually show that Purcell effect decreases with measurement power. So here's just one example of a plot where you see that as the measurement photon number is increased, the Purcell, uh, the Purcell decay rate um, uh, referenced with respect to the Purcell rate at, at zero drive that you would calculate is expected to decrease and that quite dramatically. So it seems like, okay, this is actually at odds with, uh, with what we see in experiments at least. Um, and then uh, another piece of the puzzle, which is not directly related to Purcell, de Purcell decay, but, but it's, it's part of the picture is that when you're driving and if the drive is, is strong uh, with respect to, the, to what the qubit sees, then you can induce population of the excited states while you're driving. And there have been a number of experiments which show this, that you can populate the excited states and this heating up of the qubit may basically entrain additional relaxation. And these might look like T1 events, but in fact, you're, uh, you're, you're seeing excitations into the excited states of the qubits and then uh, the, those excited states leak out of the system, which might look effectively like a depletion of the, of the first excited state population. 
So what I want to tell you here is, uh, I want to tell you about a theory for uh, enhancements of the Purcell effect um, only. So I'm not considering any other um, uh, decay channels and I'm not considering dephasing. Um, and the starting point is exactly the setup of those Yale experiments. So we are thinking of a qubit, which is relaxing through its cavity, and the cavity is driven to a steady state of n bar photons. Um, so if you think of the idealization of this, uh, of this, of this setup, um, we consider a circuit like this, where you have a transmon qubit, which is this object depicted in red, and this is capacitively coupled to a readout cavity, which we idealize as a single LC resonator, a single harmonic mode. And the bare cavity, uh, uh, which, which is this LC, is coupled to a, uh, to a waveguide, uh, through which basically excitations can leak out of the system and through which we can also drive the system. So those drives on the cavity that I showed you in that idealized picture of a atom in a fabry perot type cavity, this is really how they are done in, in a circuit QED setup. And um, um, the starting point for our theory was to say that, well, we actually have a transmon qubit, so it's a weakly and harmonic oscillator. It's pretty much like a, a, an LC uh, circuit for those of you who are new to this plus some nonlinear corrections in which basically the current uh, does not depend linearly on the, on the flux through this uh, in a nonlinear inductance, but really it depends sinusoidally. So then this allows us to perform a perturbation theory around the harmonic limit. Um, and in addition to that, the system is driven. So that's an important aspect. We want to also do a perturbation theory for a driven system. So the, our starting point was to think about the small parameters epsilon, which is an indication of the n-harmonicity for the transmon qubit, and the drive strength, which we uh, uh, represent as uh, the square root of the number of photons in the steady state of the cavity. So why did we choose to do this? It is because this is compatible with the black box quantization picture of this, which we have a set of harmonic modes which are interacting through quartic nonlinearities with each other. In addition to that, this allows us to perform a perturbative expansion and to do an order by order rotating wave approximation. Moreover, and this goes beyond what was done with black box quantization, it allows you to also figure out what the dissipative effects are upon doing the rotating wave approximation. This goes in the spirit of the paper by Boissonneau and collaborators in 2009 that I told you about. But what it does in addition to that is that it's not a perturbation theory and the coupling G uh, between the qubit and the cavity, but rather it's a perturbation theory in the weakened harmonicity of the qubit. But this is more suitable for transmon qubits. And what our theory found is that there is an enhancement of relaxation rates and that can be done without having a drastic phasing mechanism, which, by the way, can also be accounted for in this theory, uh, gladly. So uh, finally, the most important finding is that counter-rotating terms, the ones that you neglect in rotating wave approximations at various levels, actually are very important because they address the lifetimes. So let me go on and give you a very uh, simple picture of how one goes about doing the perturbation theory. So uh, first of all, you start with a circuit such as this, which is uh, the system uncoupled to its path. Uh, this is just the system of the qubit coupled to the cavity. They are capacitively coupled. And then um, you go to a normal mode representation in which you uh, essentially eliminate at the level of the quadratic Hamiltonian this capacitive coupling between the qubit and the uh, LC re readout resonator. And the effective picture that you get is that, well, uh, then you will just end up with a theory which is diagonal at the linear order. These are the normal modes which there will be a, of which there will be an, uh, a qubit-like, which is A, stands for atom, and a cavity-like, C, mode. But in addition, those modes are mixed by this nonlinear element, which I'm representing here by this so-called spider symbol, which appears often in the literature. Um, and this nonlinear coupling now between the normal nodes mixes both of those normal nodes through nonlinear interactions, the, uh, the lowest order of which is a quartic interaction, but it also mixes them with the drive photons. So we have been careful to displace the theory so that the effects of the drive are all encapsulated at the level of the nonlinearity. And this is the important point because we can think now of this as being the perturbation. And 
this perturbation is now in two small parameters, epsilon, which is the size of the enharmonicity of the Josephson junction, mm -hmm. and eta, which is the size of the drive. We are considering a weak drive effect. Alex, this might be a minor question, <clears throat> but on the right-hand side in the figure, um, you've drawn the spider element as sort of coupling them in what would be like phi sub a minus phi sub c squared, I imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but in that sum, would we normally write the sum of, you know, it'd be phi sub a plus phi sub c, the flux across each of those sums as opposed to subtracted? And so that, uh, so I wonder if maybe the picture would be more of where the two are, the two LCs are in series and then the spider connects from one end to the other. I'm not really sure of the answer here, but. but uh, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. And yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I think that a more careful uh, uh, analysis of this would be, uh, yeah, is needed. To be honest, I wanted to be schematic and. Uh, <laughs> Show uh, show a very pictorial way of how the normal nodes get coupled only non-linearly, but you're right. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's and you could always argue that uh, that uh, it's all in the signs of these hybridization uh, coefficients that you get the difference or the sum. Yeah, because the different schematics correspond to different topologies, and they're not actually all equivalent. So just I guess it's something to be yeah. cautious of. Yeah, I understand. And I know that you know quite a bit of, about this, uh, given your also your recent publication. Good. Mm -hmm. So, OK, maybe um, I'm just going to use this uh, idealization for now. Uh, but of course, the equations don't uh, the equations are faithful to the reality. This is just a this is just a picture to sort of help us get the intuitions. So um, just to give you an impression of, of, of how uh, uh, how basically, uh, uh, well, we have worked out uh, what we what happens to the system Hamiltonian, and now uh, what we need to do is we need to work out what happens to the uh, coupling of the system to its environment. So when we have done this uh, normal mode uh, diagonalization, uh, we have gone from a system of two coupled nodes, uh, one of which was coupled to the environment to uh, basically linear combinations of these two modes. And now what we find is that both of these modes couple capacitively to the same, uh, to the same environment. So this is, this is the source of the Purcell effect. I think that I want to stress that this is, this is a very fundamental point, that the Purcell effect uh, to first order is a linear effect. It just has to do with the fact that the, one of the bare modes is coupled to the cavity, which is the, the readout cavity is coupled to this waveguide, so to the environment, but the qubit is coupled to this readout cavity. And when we do the normal mode transformation, the qubit itself now becomes coupled to the readout cavity. And this is what gives us Purcell. Um, but of course, there's this uh, spider symbol there's the nonlinearity, and because there's nonlinearity, when we work out which operator of the system actually couples to the environment, it's not going to be only this linear combination that gave us the Purcell effect. But in, in addition to that, we're going to pick up nonlinear corrections that enhance the Purcell effect. And much of this talk is about those nonlinear corrections that enhance the Purcell, especially in the presence of drive. Good. So. I want to dwell for a few slides on the methodology that we used in this work. And um, uh, I think this is important because this is a technique that goes beyond the problem of readout. It can be applied to gates and it has been successfully applied to, to the study of gates or parametric gates. Um, so it's, it's really a, a technique of more generality than just readout. So what we do is an order by order removal of the non QND terms in the Hamiltonian. I'm taking a very schematic view of the Hamiltonian in which you have diagonal blocks and you can think of the diagonal blocks as being the QND part of the Hamiltonian. And then uh, what we do is we perform a time dependent schrieffer wolf transformation. And the effect of that time dependent schrieffer wolf transformation on the system Hamiltonian is that it reduces these off diagonal non QND terms um, uh, order by order in perturbation theory, and it enhances what exists on the diagonal, so the QND part of the Hamiltonian. And the goal of this transformation is uh, to get a Kernon linear oscillator theory 
in which the normal modes are coupled only by terms which conserve the photon number in each of those, uh, those modes. But this kernel linear oscillator theory has drive-dependent couplings. So the corrections such as stark shifts or shifts in the Kerr constants due to drive are encapsulated in this theory. And in addition to that, in doing this diagonalization, you will incur corrections to dissipators. And that's really important. That's, that's what gives us effective master equations and corrections which are nonlinear to the decay. All right. So to be more explicit, what we need to do is to perform a unitary transformation. This kind of uh, unitary transformation has to be performed on the system Hamiltonian. But because the system Hamiltonian is driven, as is the case in readout, you need to do the transformation on the Floquet Hamiltonian. So if you want, in order to remove unwanted interactions at the level of the Hamiltonian, you need a generator of this unitary transformation, which is time dependent. And in order to preserve the structure of the Schrodinger equation, uh, you want to, uh, to transform the Floquet Hamiltonian. So this H minus ID2, you have to take into account the effect of the so-called energy operator, which is the time derivative with respect to time, or the derivative with respect to time. And the desire is that once you have done this uh, unitary transformation, you, have to, you arrive at a simple form, a form that is more diagonal. And what we really mean by more diagonal for this talk is it's a Kerr theory. So there are as many operators A as there are A daggers and as many C operators as there are C daggers in our theory. So how do we do this? Well, in fact, what we do, we perform a perturbative expansion. This is baker campbell hausdorff lemma tells us that this exponential um, uh, unitary operator can be expanded in a series and the resulting Hamiltonian will look like this, where I have expanded it to second order in this generator. So, um, of course, um, we first have to uh, decide what we want to cancel out from the Hamiltonian. So the system Hamiltonian was this quadratic part, which I showed you before. This is uh, the uncoupled uh, harmonic oscillators. Then, as I have uh, uh, suggested before, the coupling between these modes comes in the nonlinear terms. And there is a series uh, which describes the nonlinear Josephson junction with terms which are quartic and then of sixth order and so on and so forth. Yeah. So a black box, yes. And maybe just to clarify here, um, these these Hamiltonians are all uh, already uh, written in, in the uh, rotating in the interaction picture where you've eliminated the linear modes. Yeah, they um, are. They are. Uh, you you could do that, but uh, that's that's uh, that's not. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a simpler way of putting it. Yeah, you could go to that interaction picture, but that's actually a subtle point. In fact, what you're seeing here, the way I've written them, they are just written in the displaced frame where we have displaced in order to remove the linear terms in the drive. So there are still, there's still the H2 where the quadratic terms are in the Hamiltonian. Oh, I see. So here you All would right. like to keep the quadratic terms. Exactly. They are still around. Uh, okay. And what you said uh, provides a simplification, but I decided to skip that step for this talk because it's just probably simpler to present this way. Okay, I see. Okay. Um, but maybe if you're doing the, the, the full specialist approach, you would do that step, or is there a reason to avoid it? No, it's actually, it's, uh, uh, there's, well, there's one reason to avoid going to interaction pictures which are too complicated, which is uh, the bosonic algebra is a little harder. Mm -hmm. I can talk about that in more detail. Uh, but uh, indeed, it's much simpler to go to interaction pictures with respect to quadratic Hamiltonians because in that case, one just picks up phases uh, next, to, uh, next to the creation annihilation operators. If you go to a full nonlinear interaction picture with respect to a, a diagonal Kerr theory, then you don't only pick phases, but you pick up operators and exponents, and then uh, everything gets a little more complicated. So yeah, thanks for, that's a great point. And that kind of uh, says that the more exact you want to be, the more you have to go to computer algebra techniques and to matrix representations instead of simple bosonic algebra, bosonic operator algebra. Okay. Um, so, um, okay, coming back to this, we have this Hamiltonian, which is expanded as a perturbative series. 
And in each of these nonlinear terms, there are two types of contributions. There are contributions which are number conserving, which are given by this, um, uh, uh, by, by, by uh, which I'm representing schematically by these purple diagonal entries in the matrix. And there are uh, operators which are number non-conserving, such as this one, where you have an imbalanced number of A's and an imbalanced number of C's. And the job is to find a generator for the uh, unitary transformation above in order to cancel all of these unwanted contributions. So in a sense, what you're doing is you're doing RWA, but you're doing it via unitary transformation. And this is really the spirit of this, that when you are doing an RWA, rotating wave approximation, it is performed by a unitary, and you need to uh, then follow the unavoidable consequences of having performed this unitary, for example, on the system bath Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a technical question, but uh, I know at least Moen and I had talked a little bit about the equivalence between like a second order RWA versus uh, this Schrieffer Wolf transform of Fouquet, and I think we saw that it looked almost the same. There were some differences. I don't know if you thought more about that at all. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, at least my my uh, my intuition is that the two uh, are um, are um, identical. If you go if you start from the right interaction picture, uh, then uh, the Schrieffer Wolf can be shown that it's 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 basically an order by order R W A. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about that uh, in more detail. I don't have material on that here. Okay. Yeah. It's Maybe after the uh, end. Yeah, but but I, I want to stress one point that that uh, uh, at the time when we wrote this work, um, this was this is really not not uh, an RWA. So we are um, allowing for the number conserving terms, which are time dependent, because as you will see, we actually feed what we derive here into a numerical uh, tag, into a numerical integration of the master equation. So we did not care to get a full um, analytical form. And it seemed more uh, more economical, again, for bosonic representation point of view, uh, to just keep time dependence in the curl-like terms. All right, so this is not a full RWA. It's just eliminating number non-conserving terms. Um, and I think we have some questions I've missed here from the um, audience, from Anirudh. Right. Do we choose the generators of the uh, SWT, the schrieffer wolf transform, in order to simplify the Fouquet expansion, or do we truncate the expansion using a small parameter argument like the Magnus expansion? We choose the... So, so I will go more in detail into... Uh, to what the small parameter is. Actually, it will it will come towards the end of the talk. What the small parameter is, but um, but what we choose, and I, this actually is great because it takes me to my next slide. The generator is expanded over um, uh, over this, the powers of the enharmonicity itself, and then going back to that Baker Campbell Hausdorff expansion, we go order by order in the powers of the enharmonicity. This is the small parameter that we take for the expansion. And then we ensure that the generator cancels those terms. So because we want to cancel these n to n's, and uh, which are the number non-conserving terms that order um, um, epsilon to the power n, yeah, we want to cancel these. And the first ones that we want to cancel are the, uh, uh, pardon, the n4. The n4 is order epsilon. Uh, they will be canceled by a component of the generator, uh, which is proportional to epsilon. And then this all results in a differential equation for the generator. And I, I want to stress that this is a very important point. The generator is time dependent. And because of the Floquet structure, uh, the generator will obey a differential equation. And if you want, this is the meeting point between Magnus expansions and schrieffer wolf transformations. Again, I don't have slides for this, but this is... This type of relationship shows you that, in fact, G4 ends up being the interaction picture expression of the perturbation that you want to remove. And um, one additional point, this is a differential equation. It has to obey an initial condition. And this is very important. Not any generator will actually do. You want to make sure that at time zero, the generator cancels the unwanted interactions at time zero. So if you want, this is standard Schrieffer-Wolf perturbation theory without time dependence. 
and time dependence adds some dynamics to that generator. And um, maybe addressing further that question, going to higher orders means that you are going to have to solve ever increasing uh, equations, which are still first order in time uh, for the higher order terms in the generators. And since these are operator valued uh, equations, um, non-commuting operator valued equations, can, can you say a little bit about the difficulty of finding the solution, even though it's a linear first order? Absolutely. So, yeah, thank you. That's 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 that question serves me well. Um, that's uh, I, I wrote here that you require computer algebra to solve these. So, you can um, you can use bosonic algebra in order to cast these equations in very simple forms. It turns out that you can simply expand the Hamiltonian over monomials such as this or that. And it turns out that when you uh, write down this equation, all you have to do is solve for the coefficients of each of these monomials individually. There's no mixing between those coefficients, at least at the lowest order. At higher orders, there will start to be mixing between the coefficients of the monomials, but not at lowest order. So for that, we used computer algebra. In fact, we used a, uh, a package in Mathematica that does bosonic algebra, which was originally developed for fermionic problems. Um, um, and we adapted that for this problem. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Yeah, I guess you do the normal order expansion and then treat that as a... Yeah, and then, a... and then in that normal order, expansion, you have coefficients which are time dependent and um, you, you kind of work with the you, you, you can think of the terms in the normal ordered expansion, the bosonic operators, as being basis operators. It turns into a large matrix problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And of um, course, a finite matrix representation would be completely different than you would solve a finite matrix representation form of this equation. So I think Anuruda is very satisfied with the answer. She says, thank you for the answer. The choice of the generator is really very elegant. <laughs> Thought I would share that. Um, Thank you. Well, by the end of this talk, I might say a couple of words of how it can be made better. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> uh, good. There is one more quick question, I think, uh, from yeah. the audience here. If you, if uh, your nonlinearity couples two resonators slightly detuned uh, with a Kerr coupling, um, they say, how do you avoid classical four wave mixing and stimulating sidebands? So I, I guess this is. Uh, this is a question a little bit about, you know, some of these terms are classical, some of these terms are quantum, and uh, I think part of the answer might have to do with exactly the terms you're dropping out are going to be those terms that, that avoid this uh, sidebands. Uh, uh, I'm helping maybe recast the question. I, I guess, I guess, I guess the point is, well, we're not dropping out any terms. Actually, the whole point of this approach is that uh, dropping out a term in the approximation actually amounts to designing a unitary for it, going to a specific rotating frame, and that rotating frame is a not, it's, it's, it's generated by something nonlinear, um, in which, yes, the term was dropped, but then we work out the effects uh, at the order of dissipation, of course, but I guess that's not the question. Um, yeah, I guess we're going to a frame in which if these nonlinear effects uh, um, are, uh, if you want, erased, then in order to retrieve them, you have to go back to the lab frame by inverting the transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers uh, yeah, part thank of the you. question at least. Thank you. All right. So um, this takes me to the next point. So, okay, we've done something to the Hamiltonian, which basically amounts to distilling it, to simplifying it, and bringing it to a car form. Uh, but we need to uh, work out what happens at the level of the, of the what happens to a master equation for the system. So what we've done so far, we focused on this yellow area. We've, we've uh, done something to the system Hamiltonian that simplifies it. What happens now to the couplings to the environment? That's the next question. So for that, the consequence of this theory, it allows you to get an effective master equation. So um, I want to take you back a little bit to how we derive master equations. 
So typically what we do, we have the system Hamiltonian, then we have a system bath Hamiltonian, coupling it to the environment. It's a linear coupling, if you want to take that uh, simple assumption. Here it's a capacitive coupling, so this is suitable. We write the system bath interaction in the interaction picture with respect to the system Hamiltonian. And I want to, what I want to contend here is that um, if you write the system bath uh, Hamiltonian in this form, this is an approximation of its interaction picture form with respect to this to the full Hamiltonian. And I don't have, um, uh, I did not prepare slides to prove this, but it's it's fairly simple to see. You have performed an order by order diagonalization of your Hamiltonian. Uh, you have brought it into a simple form, which is this H effective, which was just a Kerr theory. I, uh, this is the content of the previous slides. And uh, the correction from that Kerr theory is this generator here. And I have told you that because the generator obeys a certain differential equation, you can show that it is in fact the, uh, related to the perturbation uh, in the Hamiltonian, the term that was undesired and you wanted to remove. So in fact, coalescing these two gives you a, an approximation of the system Hamiltonian. And the higher order you go with G, the higher you go in order with G, the better approximation uh, you will have for the uh, full time evolution with respect to the system Hamiltonian. And uh, typically the step that follows when we derive the master equation, once you have written the system bath interaction in this form, you find that uh, uh, there are certain transition that the system, transitions that the system bath um, um, uh, Hamiltonian uh, uh, can uh, uh, effect onto the system. These are characterized by a set of collapse operators, which I uh, write here symbolically as collapse operator C of omega J. And this happens at the collection of frequencies which are related to transition frequencies in the system Hamiltonian. So these omega j's, each of these operators comes with a phase factor, and then that you multiply into the bath operator, which is this, which I'm just, which you, you should just think of this as a bosonic operator. It's, bath is a collection of bosonic modes. And the next step that uh, happens when you derive the master equation, you perform a born mark of approximation and then um, and secular approximation, and you end up with the Lindblad form of the master equation. And um, what's important here is that there's a simplified form for the system Hamiltonian, which is just this HS effective. And uh, you obtain a collection of dissipators, and this collection of dissipators now, uh, importantly, um, has a few features. It's a sum over many transition frequencies. This is not just a dissipator of the operator A or a dissipator of the operator C, but it's a sum over all the possible transitions that can happen in the system. And because it's nonlinear, there are many transition frequencies. Um, good, so this is basically our strategy to get to the master, effective master equation. We will have a simplified Hamiltonian here in the unitary dynamics but there will be a more complicated structure here in the dissipators, which I will uh, make explicit later. And, and so I, um, if you have the generacies of transitions, those all get lumped together into the C hat. That's exactly, that's, yeah, that, that's right. So C hat sums all the possible transitions that happen at a single frequency. If you had a harmonic oscillator, all the possible transitions between consecutive Fox states would be lumped together in the C of omega, which just becomes the annihilation or creation operator. And yeah. what happens if you have near perfect degeneracies, but not quite, uh, things that are almost degenerate, especially with respect to the rest of the time scales in the system? Um, right, so there you have to make a choice. It's a question of how you do the secular approximation on the system to path coupling. If you do it in a sharp way, then you will end up uh, with uh, separate dissipators for each transition. But there's a problem there because, uh, for example, uh, uh, you run into trouble when you try to look at a driven bosonic degree of freedom with a small nonlinearity. And um, another way to do it is to take a more lax view, which is actually what we did here and think that all of these transitions happen at roughly the same energy and end up with a nonlinear um, uh, but bosonic uh, operator, which, which is written in terms of bosonic creation annihilation. And I would say that this is still, the call is still open on which, which approach you should take. But ultimately, you are making a secular approximation, and it boils down to that, how strict you are in that approximation.
Yeah, I guess that physically would depend on something like the correlation bath time. Uh, and you say basically you would group things under one frequency, even though they might not, strictly speaking, be at exactly the same frequency. You would just lump that all into one C and right. one average frequency, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. OK. Um, thank you. Thank you for the question. So OK, so the last point on this slide was that uh, uh, Although it might not seem so at first sight, what we're doing here is we're getting an approximate analytical form of a Floquet master equation, Floquet Markov master equation. Why do I say that? Because um, this is a Floquet Hamiltonian. It's driven, um, it's periodic with respect to the period of the readout drive. And we are looking for an accurate description of the coupling of the system to the bath. So we are doing kind of a block red field approach that was outlined here. And when you do that for a Floquet Hamiltonian, there's a there's a way to express everything in terms of, of a more economical representation, which is the Floquet representation. So we're not doing that here. We're doing it analytically and in an approximate form, but I will come back towards the end of the talk on, on current efforts on solving this problem numerically with Floquet master equation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead. This slide will be a little heavy, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, uh, give you a bird's eye view of what the effective master equation looks for qubit plus readout. And I just want to say that this is only a very small subset of all the possible terms that can occur. And that due to our methods with computer algebra, we were able to basically index all of the interactions and catalog them. And we just selected the ones that were most relevant. So the effect of the drive is first and foremost, it will give you some AC start shifts on those normal modes due to the interactions in the nonlinearity. This is something that we expect. And then in addition to that, you will get nonlinear interactions between the normal modes. We have a cross curve interaction. You should really think of epsilon times omega bar A here. Uh, there was a notation defined before, but you should really think of this as being EC. So this is the size of the enharmonicity and you have an interaction between A and C. Additionally, you have a self curve and you have a self curve for the cavity, which is smaller but than the self curve for the, for the qubits. These hybridization coefficients are close to one for UAA. This is the participation of normal mode A in the bare mode A and the participation of normal mode C in the bare mode A. You should really think of UAC as being something like G over delta if you're familiar with the dispersive theory for James Cummings. So this is the effective kernel linear Hamiltonian. And as I uh, uh, suggested before, there are time dependencies. In fact, each of these couplings has some small time dependent part, which you could remove if you thought in an RWA fashion for this. So next, the effective master equation is um, obtained as, as this. And of all of that collection of operators, and thanks Latko for asking that question, we keep only two. We keep a dis dissipator that uh, acts at the qubit frequency and the dissipator that acts at the cavity frequency. We take a very, very simplified view in which we lump together a lot of transitions and we know that the error we're making is on the order of the enharmonicities, which we're assuming to be small. And uh, what's more important is that in this approach, you're probing the spectral function of the, of the environment at different values. So these kappas of omega are really uh, S of omega, where S is the spectral function, power spectral function of the, of the, um, of the, of the environment. So now there were two dissipators that we boiled down to. There's one dissipator at the qubit frequency and the most important component of this dissipator at the qubit frequency, at least in this, uh, at, at least uh, a sort of uh, uh, at the formal level, not at the quantitative level, is the Purcell decay. So the Purcell decay comes from a hybridization of the qubit with the cavity. So it's really a linear theory effect. And that's why you see this hybridization factor here and this collapse operator here is proportional to the relaxation operator on the qubit. Now, in addition to that, there's a host of other corrections which come from the nonlinearity, which is marked by this uh, epsilon, the size of the enharmonicity. And what's important is that this is a nonlinear correction to Purcell decay. And inside of this nonlinear correction, you see a contribution which is proportional to the n bar 
see the n bar in the cavity, steady state population of the cavity. So what we have here is an expression for parcel decay, but corrected uh, by drive dependent terms. And in fact, if you work out what this expression is, it is typically negative. So you'll see a, a, a decrease in the parcel decay. And this will be, uh, this will be shown in, in the numerical results that, that will come on the next slides. But more importantly, what you find are these nonlinear processes that enter the collapse operator at the qubit frequency. And one of them, which is the most resonant because of this small denominator here, is the stimulated emission process. That means that a photon can leak off of the transmon together with a photon on the cavity. Or on the other hand, a photon from the transmon can uh, be swapped onto the onto the cavity. So basically the photon number is conserved, but the photon leaves the transmon and goes into the cavity. Both of these stimulated emission processes have amplitudes which are proportional to the square root of n. So they are they can be rather rather large and we will show their effect in a moment. And just to 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 show you that there's a symmetry in this theory and uh, uh, one could work out all of these complex expressions for both, of course, and for many others. Um, here we have the cavity decay, and that's maybe not the most important because it's what you would expect. You just get, again, some hybridization and the collapse operator for the cavity. But in addition to that, you get relaxation-induced defacing. So there is a defacing at, of the qubit due to this operator, which happens at the cavity frequency. And of course, if we had introduced additional channels of relaxation, uh, we know that we can also obtain, for example, um, relaxation induced by a defacing channel, just like the dress defacing theory. So in a sense, this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this can allow us to get a complete picture of what dissipative channels we have. So what we have achieved is a kernel linear theory, but with non-RWA corrections to the master equation. And now I would like to uh, uh, stop a little bit and ponder about these terms of stimulated emission and sort of argue why they are important and why they appear in these dissipators after all when you're driving. So just actually one very important point is that you should note that all of these terms that I uh, told you about would be actually vanishing if there was no drive. These are really drive activated processes. So let's see how stimulated emission should occur, why, why it should occur at the qubit frequency. So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you here the spectrum of the system, and I'm uh, collecting the levels by total photon numbers. So you have zero photons here. This is the ground state manifold for both of the degrees of freedom. And then you have a one photon excitation manifold, a two photon excitation manifold, and so forth. And the drive frequency is nearly resonant with the cavity transition frequency. So again, the number 0A1C denotes one photon in the cavity, zero in the qubit, and so on. Uh, single photon processes, so single photon relaxation. Um, a, this, this is like a sigma minus event, the qubit relaxes. And all of these arrows denote the pathways through which the qubit can lose a photon in the presence of zero cavity photons, one cavity photon, and so on and so forth. Stimulated emission processes are of the type AC. So you annihilate a photon on each one of the two degrees of freedom, two, two modes. And they look like these longer arrows. So at first you would say this doesn't happen at frequency omega A like the other one, which was, oops, like the other one which was happening at frequency omega A. This actually happens at the frequency which looks more like omega A plus omega C. But you have to remember that you're in a driven system and in a floquet picture, there are translates of the frequencies of the, each of the eigenmodes translates by integer multiples of the drive frequency. So in fact, the process that you thought was happening at omega A plus omega C is in a rotating frame happening at only omega A. And it just happens to be between the um, uh, two photon state but, uh, and the zero photon state but aided by a drive photon. So effectively, it's at omega A, the qubit frequency. And that's why it enters that dissipator and not a dissipator at omega A plus omega C. It also enters that dissipator at the sum frequencies, but with a smaller uh, contribution. And similarly, the AC dagger events can also happen at frequency omega A 
in this picture here, it would look like you're just exciting the system because the cavity frequency is slightly above the qubit frequency. But again, in a rotating frame, considering the effects of the translation with respect to the drive photons, these look like relaxation processes which happen at uh, approximately omega a, the qubit frequency. So this is, I think, the most qualitative picture that I have to, to, to argue why these terms should actually appear in the, in the, in the dissipators. So um, what we did was we took these, um, um, we took this large master equation that I showed you before, including many more contributions that I did not show you, which were less relevant. And then we um, exported it um, from our uh, computer algebra directly into uh, MATLAB, and we simulated the master equation. And what we had in mind was exactly this kind of experimental setup where we uh, start with the qubit in its excited state, and then we just let the qubit relax while we drive the cavity so it's in a steady state population. So first of all, you look at the cavity and you see that the readout cavity population quickly relaxes to the steady state population that you, that you, that you put in by design, you change the drive amplitude. Um, and then we wanted to know how does the qubit relax? Does it relax differently if the number of photons changes? And in fact, it does. So the prediction from that theory is that the uh, qubit excited state population decays exponentially, which is, yes, it's, it's to be expected. But what was, uh, what was less expected was in fact, the fact that uh, there's a drastic change in the qubit relaxation time. Um, the qubit relaxes faster and faster as you put more and more um, um, readout power into the cavity, or if you want the steady state population of the cavity increases. And what's important is that if you did not take into account um, all of these nonlinear corrections to the dissipators, so you just consider that you have a Kerr nonlinear theory plus uh, dissipator of A and dissipator of C, um, so non nonlinear corrections, you would find absolutely no correction to the relaxation rate. Um, yeah, in fact, the Kerr theory has absolutely no correction induced to the relaxation rates compared to what the linear theory would give you. So this is one example where uh, the rotating wave approximation is detrimental if you want to describe dissipation. Um, good. So um, more importantly, this is a very large increase. So if you actually look at the, the sizes of these, uh, of the magnitude of this effect, it's, it's very, very large. And I will go on to tell you a little bit more. more and, and Alex, this is really nice. Can you also, help review for us where that extra um, energy is going in a sense. It's going through the cavity into the bath, right? And it's going through some levels of the cavity. And yeah. uh, I think you were showing slides earlier on, but is it obvious what levels of the cavity are, is it, you know, one or two particular levels of the cavity that are involved or is it really just the whole slew of all cavity states? So there, there's, there's. So this picture here that I showed you just shows that you're resonantly coupling um, uh, uh, levels in the spectrum. Um, uh, so basically, it shows you that qubit relaxation can happen through a, a collection of transitions, and they are not just uh, single photon transitions. They are also two photon transitions, such as this, right? Um, but in addition to that, you should think of this uh, as happening at every photon number possible for the cavity, okay? So uh, if you want, you, you should really think of Poisson weighing all of these transitions as you increase the photon number in the cavity. And in particular, as you're increasing N bar, that Poisson distribution is actually sliding with N bar. It's centered at N bar. So, uh, uh, completely different sets of levels will actually be participating in these rates as you're increasing N bar. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, hmm. So there isn't really an obvious way to design the system to avoid. Yeah, I remember in uh, the Dan Sank uh, paper from from uh, Santa Barbara from some time ago in, in the Korobkov work, uh, you know, they, they all saw particular resonances that were very prominent as a function of power, but they were much higher powers. Uh, so, so maybe it's a different uh, effect, right? This is more of a collective, like you said, whereas that there, it was a very narrow transition specific. They could identify 
you know which levels it was exactly. Um, so my if if I remember well, uh, in that case, uh, those those resonances were happening at very specific powers. So, right. Uh, That's right. Whereas whereas here, these processes kick in as soon as you turn on the drive. Yeah. And uh, the contention is that they kick in quite strongly, so they uh, they have there's a strong effect. Gotcha. Yeah, it's not a fine tuned. The the reason why they're there is not fine tuned, at least not from this theory. I will come back to this at the end. Okay. All right. Um, So let me summarize a little bit this this fan plot in a more uh, in a more distilled uh, distilled plot. So you can look at the relaxation rate of the qubit uh, as a function of n bar, and you can look at the relative change of this relaxation rate with respect to the to the undriven relaxation rate. Yeah. And uh, this this should be zero for a linear oscillator. If you have a linear oscillator and you drive it, nothing should happen to it, right? You should not you should not change its relaxation rate because it's linear. Now it turns out if you if we did the Kerr theory simulation, um, uh, again nothing happened to it. So Kerr theory alone cannot actually predict these additional relaxation processes. If we removed from the master equation all of the nonlinear terms all of these AC and AC dagger terms that I showed you before, um, then we would actually find that the, the rate decreases a little bit with drive. And this is really the nonlinear Purcell effect. And it's consistent with all of those previous studies, which were done in a different perturbation theory than us. But that's comforting to know. But in addition to that, what we find, if we keep all of the terms in the master equation, we find that there's a drastic increase um, in the relaxation rate. And uh, one thing that will immediately strike you here is uh, the corrections are huge um, on a scale of, uh, uh, of one photon. You're predicting uh, a factor five uh, increase in the relaxation rate. So obviously this cannot be true. And uh, yes, the answer is this is not true. This is just uh, a feature, this is not, it's an artifact of the perturbation theory that will uh, try to tell you uh, a little bit about how this can be fixed, um, but what it does tell you is that there is a um, there is a an, uh, um, dominant effect of these correlated terms, which kicks in as soon as you turn on the drive, and uh, you can rely on this perturbation theory really close to n bar uh, to to small n bar, say up to point one, in order to predict for you what their role will be, but. Uh, uh, beyond that value for n bar, you cannot rely on perturbative approaches unless you do some kind of reformation. And I'll come back to that. So I would say that uh, the main message here is that there are important terms that kick in, um, but the theory cannot quantitatively predict their uh, effect uh, for uh, moderate values of n bar. This is just telling you what happens at small n bar. So to sort of further uh, characterize this, uh, this uh, uh, this aspect, uh, we have noted there are these large contributions from the correlated decay terms. If we plot the relative sizes of the terms in the master equation, um, um, uh, the coefficients of each of these terms in the collapse operator versus the n bar at the specific detuning corresponding to readout, we would find that um, uh, they quickly exceed the coefficient of the A collapse operator, which is the, the one responsible for just per cell decay. Um, um, and they will exceed that value over uh, uh, one photon of, of uh, if you vary the, the readout drive from zero to one photons, they will exceed it by, by factors, which is, which is large. And now I'm just going to pick uh, a value of n bar equals 0.5, which is a small value and show you what the issue seems to be. The issue seems to be with the fact that you're driving very resonantly. So in fact, when we started out to do this theory, we, um, uh, we considered a situation with nearly resonant drive because we're driving at a frequency which is very close to the cavity frequency. It's, it's deviating from that by a very small value. 
And in fact, if you look at the coefficients of those collapse operators, uh, versus the detuning of the drive, if you allow yourself to vary the detuning, uh, keeping the photon number fixed, would find that their effect actually decreases as a function of this detuning, and they go to zero. You're only going to be left with a single photon uh, terms, and that can happen over a few chi's. That's important. Because if you go on and you simulate the master equation now by uh, making the drive a little more off resonant, you find that the relaxation rate as a function of n bar for this n bar equals 0.5 actually um, uh, incurs corrections and the corrections grow as you come close to resonance. But as you move away from resonance, you converge to the zero drive result, which is this, uh, which is essentially the parcel and its nonlinear corrections, which are drive independent. So the take home message here is that actually the stimulated emission terms that appear here in the perturbation theory decay algebraically as omega d moves away from omega c. So this is a signature of the fact that we have insisted to do perturbation theory in a theory which was driven resonantly. So this kind of poses questions about how you set up your rotating wave approximation to begin with. Um, but uh, so in order to sort of clarify this a little further, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what terms actually generate those correlated decay processes. So these are nearly resonant terms in the resulting Hamiltonian, nonlinear Hamiltonian. And uh, they, this is basically their form. They come uh, as uh, basically um, uh, cubics, uh, which are assisted by one drive photon. So you have three operators and you have one power of the uh, coherent state amplitude. And um, this is just to illustrate to you the kinds of uh, monomial expansions we look at. And the most important point here is to establish what the small parameter of the, the perturbative expansion is when you're driving close to resonance. So if you go to the interaction picture, which uh, is, is really the right picture in which you can address the sizes of these terms, you notice that these are driven at very, very slow frequencies. So chi is a very small quantity compared to the drive frequency. Um, chi is really the detuning between the C mode and the drive, okay? Um, and it might seem to you, if you just looked at the coupling strength in front of the in front of this term, that the small parameters of the expansion should be eta, which is the magnitude of the coherent state due to the readout drive, and epsilon, which is uh, which is which is this quantity that parameterizes the enharmonicity. But in fact, for a rotating wave approximation to be valid, what you need is that the ratio between the coupling strength here and the frequency at which the term rotates has to be small. And when you work that out for a readout drive, which is close to resonant, but at exactly this value, which is half of the dispersive shift under the cavity frequency, you find that the small parameter needs to be actually square root of n bar. So what I'm telling you here is basically this is a perturbation theory that we set up. And the validity of this perturbation theory uh, uh, is, is, is guaranteed by a smallness of this parameter as opposed to this parameter, which is in fact much smaller than n bar because of this hybridization coefficient here. So the take home message here is that the results of this theory are qualitatively correct, but it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. How large can n bar be? Strong drive effects already affect us for small photon numbers. This is one take home message. And this is work in progress that I will not uh, have uh, time to talk about here, but it, it turns out that series resummation may provide the solution to this problem, in which basically uh, uh, you take into account the fact that all of these drive terms enter through the trigonometric functions, through the cosine potential of the Josephson junction. So in fact, uh, you will never get polynomials in the drive amplitudes, but you will get Bessel functions of the drive amplitudes. So to give you just an artist rendition or a cartoon of how that would basically play a role here, uh, remember that I showed you this wildly increasing relaxation rate and I told you that it's only through uh, this prediction very close to zero drive. Uh, well, in fact, if you consider the series resummation in which you corrected for the drive amplitude to be encapsulated in these oscillatory functions or Bessel functions, you would find that in fact, there's a cutoff of this uh, runaway behavior. And in fact, the rates uh, have oscillatory behavior. And we have now 
floquet simulations and perturbation theory and the strong dry regime, which, which agree qualitatively and sort of give us this more natural picture of what happens close to zero drive. Uh, so I'm uh, getting to the point where I can summarize. So um, I have shown you a perturbation theory that predicts corrections to energy relaxation rates for a small readout cavity photon number n bar c. Uh, the spontaneous emission rate decreases with drive, which is consistent with previous literature. The perturbative expansion provides the qualitative picture of all the operators at play, of which I showed you only a small subset. Uh, the theory predicts a significant dressing of the qubit energy relaxation rate due to stimulated emission. And that's, that's I think, the most important message. And also, you need to go beyond the kernel linear oscillator theory in order to capture relaxation rate corrections. Um, uh, lastly, I want to tell you about ongoing work which was not covered here. So here in Sherbrooke, uh, we, are, uh, we have developed some corrections for the Floquet-Markov Master Equation Library in Qtip. We have corrected previous errors and we have optimized it. So this is mostly the merit of, of uh, uh, Alexandra's student, Camille Kalonek. And if you want to have a, a, an up and ready version of the code, uh, you can find it on this, at this GitHub address and you can contact her to, to get details about what we have done. And uh, trying this uh, approach on, uh, on the readout problem is consistent with these results that I showed you here at low power, but conf and confirms the dominant role of stimulated emission processes. And in addition, it's consistent with this idea that you should actually resum in order to uh, capture strong drive effects on AC start shifts and rates, et cetera. And uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge again the people I've worked with on this. So these are Moeen and Hakan in Princeton. Moeen is now at IBM, in fact. And also uh, for the ongoing work on perturbative theories and also uh, Floquet simulations, Camille Kalonek and Alexandra Blech here in Sherbrooke. I'd also like to thank uh, a few people for sharing their experimental data on this problem. And thank you all for your attention. All right, excellent. Thank you very much, Alex. This was an excellent talk. And um, hello, Gianluigi Catalani. Uh, I think you will have the first question for Alex. Um, he's out, Gianluigi says, uh, number one, I, can I think of this as a photon assisted transition in the presence yeah. of a coherent drive in analogy to photon assisted tunneling? Um, I, I don't know exactly what photon assisted tunneling is, but, um, I would, yeah, I would, I would think that, uh, you're kind of, uh, uh, because you have a resonant drive, you are, uh, you, you, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I think it's, uh, it, in that sense, yeah, it's, it's really like uh, you have, you have, a, you have two detuned levels and then you add a drive and you're, you're basically, uh, which is resonant with the detuning between those levels. And then there is a, uh, because now you are on resonance, there's a possibility to tunnel. And that's what I tried to uh, illustrate with those energy diagrams. Yeah, yeah, and it's turning it, on resonance additional and processes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, this is at the level of the dissipator. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, really, all of this is about matrix elements. Uh, if you want another way to put it, you it opens up for you the ability to excite these two photon processes because uh, there's a duality between coupling to the path or just excitation by drive. You're all you're doing all of this to the same cavity operator. Yeah. So it's coherent as well. Nice. Yes, thank you, Gianluigi, for this excellent question. Thank um, you. For our next question, we also have Gianluigi. I think he's passing on maybe a few questions, or maybe these are his own. Um, is the real, and, and by the way, you know, we, we've, I think we've had Gianluigi on this before, and if not, we should definitely bring you back so you can also get your share of questions here, and I'm sure Alex can throw some back. So. Um, Anyway, Gianluigi says, is the relaxation-induced dephasing related to the measurement-induced dephasing slash photon shot noise dephasing? So, are um, mm -hmm. I haven't thought very deeply about this, but at first sight, I would say yes. And uh, I can give you the simple, the, the simple uh, uh, kind of two cents explanation of why this happens. So you're driving, you're driving the the 
the, the cavity and through it, you're actually uh, sending some drive photons to the qubit. And when you're driving the qubit, you're tilting a little bit the quantization axis of the qubit and the rotating frame. So what was just relaxation for the qubit before is now a mixture of defacing and relaxation just because you've rotated it a little bit. Mm. So this is why you end up with this additional defacing. Mm. Mm. So. Yeah, that's a very nice picture. Um, which turns on, uh, yeah, which turns on uh, with the same uh, the same power law as the as the stimulated processes, right? Uh, as a function of drive power. Yeah, because I guess in here you can also extract all of the defacing rates as well. Um, I guess yeah. we were more focused on the absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And they, they are sizable. They're pretty large, as we can see uh, from current ongoing work. And uh, you should really think of this, uh, the qubit and readout should be really thought more as a floquet type qubit. It's a, it's a qubit and it's a, it's a dressed, dressed by drive qubit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, excellent. Well, I think if there are no more questions in the chat, I know we're almost 20 minutes over, so thank you everyone for staying and for tuning in. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, oh, and we, I see we have Josh Combs here as well. Hello, Josh. Uh, so thank you uh, everyone for tuning in from the different time zones. Uh, thank you, Alex, for taking our invitation. And uh, this talk will stay recorded and live so you can go back and review it. The seminar will continue again next Friday, uh, same time at noon Eastern. We hope to see you again. And uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you thank next you. week.